talked about violence, and this one involves boxes. Boxing, to be precise. It's Box Boy. Original. My boy. Box Boy. <laughs> Living in a box. My boy. <laughs> Living in a cardboard box. Box Boy. How Laboratory Game. You know how. Pal Hal. Pal you know. Hal. They did a... From Pal Hala. It's the Viking lore. No, they did the Kirby games. And uh, they also did Part-Time UFO, which I did a review here on the Button Mappers for. Uh, this is coming from the Wikipedia. It was an experimental project developed while the studio was working on Kirby Triple Deluxe and Kirby the Rainbow Curse. The project plan was conceived in July 2011. And it revolves around QB. QBBY, a character who can produce boxes and use them to solve puzzles, move around, and press switches. This is a cute puzzle game where you're basically a single box and then you work through a level of worlds and each world has unique challenges where you can extend QB to release a finite number of boxes from his body in order to solve puzzles. Sometimes that involves getting over uh, like pits, sometimes it involves pressing buttons and getting picked up by cranes as well as a number of other unique uh, level ideas. They're really good brain teasers. Uh, I think this is the type of game where it's really great for a commute game where you can kind of just pick it up and work through a couple puzzles and not think too deeply about it. I don't see myself really craving Box Boy when I'm home, but uh, on the road, I want some box to go. And this game was really popular. It spawned a number of sequels also on the 3DS. Box Box Boy. Bye Bye Box Boy. Inspired by NSYNC. And then on Switch, they have Box Boy and Box Girl. To my knowledge, Box Boy and Box Girl is not a remake of this game. So the game on 3DS is unique, meaning that experience there is unique. So you can't just go and download Box Boy on Switch later unless they bring it later. It's really cheap. It's like five bucks. It's cute. Some of the puzzles are a little... Um, they make me sit there and think about how to do it. There is a hint system where you can use play coins to figure it out. I tend to find myself not using it, although uh, in situations where I've been kind of just like, how the hell do I do this? Uh, I have. There's an added challenge. There's crowns in each level that are like an added challenge about trying to figure out how you get there. That's about all I got for the boy, box boy, 3DS, five bucks. Just get your have, recommend. Have you failed that? Oh. Okay. Who? How do you feel about the minimalistic like art style? How do I feel about the what art style? The minimalistic art style. Oh. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan of simplicity. I think it's cute, it looks good, and it's functional. Uh I don't I think that is a good point is that like they don't need to like overdo it. It's mainly just about a fun puzzle platformer game. They do spruce a couple cutscenes in there. Box Girl actually shows up at one point. Mm -hmm. You can customize Box Boy. I think uh get what I have him in like a, a pair of sunglasses or something. So he's pretty chill. Cool looking. Has a little flavor to the game. There's not that much though as far as customization goes. Um and then, like, I guess within the levels themselves, it's literally just, like, a black boxes are the floor, and then, like, the empty space is white. Um, works. Excellent. Looking at these screenshots here. Box boy. Oh, 034. That's what I... That's what I call the homeless man that lives down the street. I so, pass him and I say, "What's up, box boy?" And then you throw something at me. Box man. That's what I call solid. Like you call me box, box man, guy. Yo, what's up, box man? And he fucking throws like a beer bottle. I'm the box man. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. They... It's me. I'm... Oh no, he. <laughs> There's a switch version. They what? They're box boy plus box girl. That one has co-op. It's the fourth game in the series. So yeah, there is a Switch version, but it's not identical. Mm. 
And you had you played these from the beginning? Ever. I just downloaded this uh, with the impending doom of the 3DS closing. Mm. So I played this for the past month or so. World 8. There's are a you, lot of levels. Are you compelled to finish the box lore? <laughs> for lore purposes, no. I don't see myself doing a narrative analysis <laughs> on this game. Uh, but for the puzzles, are yeah, you, I could see myself going through it. Okay. You know, they, they, I, I remember, I forgot which game it is, but I remember they had a box toy amiibo, and I thought he was cute as fuck. Yeah, I've never seen it, but that'd be cool. Is this, uh, I don't want to do this game, but I think it. Is this one of the better puzzle platformers you've played, or where does this fall in all the puzzle platformers you've tried? I did play Pushmo, and I think Pushmo is a little more innovative. I think that this is fine as far as uh, puzzle platformers go. Um, honestly, I towards the latter half of the puzzles, I started to get flashbacks of the part-time UFO, where I remember getting a little frustrated, but that one... I feel it's less functional. This one, I feel like if I really thought about it, I could have figured some of these things out. But I'd be sitting there trying all these different combinations because the way it works is like, they're like, oh, you can extend Box Boy four boxes. And so you can go most directions. You go up, left, right. So you could do kind of patterns like boom, 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 boom. So like kind of like Tetris blocks is a good way to think about it. You can throw those blocks. And then sometimes I just never figure out what it is exactly they want me to do because of how the Box Boy interacts with... Some things, like there's laser beams crossing. How do I get a block to drop so I can get past the laser beams and also hit the switch so that the thing goes? There are checkpoints, so it's not really frustrating um, in that regard as far as progression goes. I don't feel like I lose progress or anything. Mm. Um, but as far as like how inspired it is, I don't think it's the most uh, impressive puzzle game I play. It's just a cool $5 one. Is it better than... Dylan's Rolling Western. I'm not doing that one today. I can't tell you. <laughs> can't speak. You have to Dylan. ask Dylan. <laughs> you have to ask Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Button mappers ask Dylan. Oh, Dylan. Your game better than Dylan. Box Boy? Whatever. Uh, um, for a long time, me and me and Damon got super into Smash Bros. And we would, every time somebody would draw the Dylan uh, assist trophy, we would just go fucking nuts because it's fucking Dylan. <laughs> All right, as you should. Just be like, holy shit, it's Dylan! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have the worst trailer up for it <laughs> as possible. Nice. PS1 game, so yeah, I can imagine it's very good. <laughs> good trailer. Everybody's golf. That's not how the theme song goes, but it would be cool. I'm going to talk about everybody's golf, known to us here in the States as Hot Shots Golf. If you know me, you know I'm a Mario golfer. I got a bit of history with the series, and Everybody's Golf, also Hot Shots Golf, was developed by Camelot, the guy's responsible for every Ooh. Mario Golf, just about, that I could see. And before they made Mario Golf, they made Hot Shots Golf for the PlayStation 1 in 1997. Actually, we have the manual here. And Spencer has the trailer up. These uh, really state-of-the-art polygon characters. Gotta love uh, PlayStation 1 graphics. But you're not here for the graphics, folks. You're here for the gameplay. This is your classic arcade style golf. And in honor of all map August, this game does have a couple courses that you could play through, but you actually have to unlock them. The game starts you off with barely anything. You get two characters in the entry course, but you actually have an XP system, which is really cool. So by either winning tournaments or versus plays or getting birdies, you can actually 
increase your XP counter, and that's how you unlock future courses. Full disclosure, up to the point of recording this, I had only dabbled, so I had played a full tournament mode, a full match play, and they also have a mini golf challenge, which I had some fun with. This is slightly more antiquated than your father's favorite Mario golf game, Toadstool Tour, my father. Uh, me, him, and I played that a lot back in the day, and uh, I know I met up with Alex lately, and we had some Mario Golf Toadstool Tour talk as well. And, uh, you know, it, I don't think that, you know, as, as their first game, understandably, it's a little bit less forgiving than some of these Mario Golf games are. So I'll explain this as best I can, but the way that it works in the game is there's basically two controls. There's the driving, where you hit the driver, and you get it to the green, which is where the pin is, and then you putt. So it's driving and putting. So each one has separate mechanics. But they both use this power gauge on the bottom of the screen, and you basically wind up your swing, and when it hits the power level that you want is when you stop it the first time, and you stop it a second time when it gets back to the origin point and you want it to be as close to the middle as possible if not directly on by the time of that second button press and that's where it gets complicated because i feel like mario golf has been more forgiving with that if you don't hit it dead on in fact they actually have an automatic uh, selector on mario golf which basically determines uh like kind of where it hits. And I think the timing's a little slower. And this one is faster, and depending on the club you use, the range is not so great. So even if you're off by just like a fraction of the red sliver, it'll mess up your shot so bad. So the first 18 that I played on a tournament mode, I actually, it was full of double bogeys, bogeys, pars, and a couple birdies. I did get one or two. But what was happening was I wasn't hitting the center part dead on. And just that slight movement would push my ball into the rough every time. And the second that you get off the fairway and into the rough grass, it makes your shot so much harder to hit. So I had a miserable time in that first game. But I did get the hang of it by the second game. The main female character, I don't have her name up, but she is the most accessible uh, as far as your shooting. And by the second time I played, I was hitting a bunch of birdies. The putting is uh, a little rough to look at. You can't really tell tell what the range of the green is. It's You can kind of see if it's at an angle, but not really. Not in the same way that you can in future Mario Golf games. Uh, but it, again, it is an early example. And, you know, I was able to get some birdies. I could read the green at times. I just like how the systems are very much intact. They have all the major clubs that you need from the woods, irons, wedge, and putter. And it's if you know Mario Golf, you know what you're getting into with Hot Shots Golf. It is a bit simple, but it's fun. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate all the different modes. I appreciate this XP system and unlockables in general. I think this is the type of game that could give you a lot for your money. Especially what I paid for it. I think I paid like 10 bucks for it at a retro game store. And, you know, you're paying a retro game store tax. So, if you want to collect PS1 games, this one's for everybody. Everybody's golf. Hot shots. Nice. Yeah, the, the Hot Shots slash Everybody's Golf series always felt like arcade golf, but for a little more of a niche audience than Mario Golf. I didn't feel like it was like meant for everybody, like Mario Golf. I don't, but I did play a lot of, not not this one, but I played a lot of um, Hot Shot Golf 2 on the PlayStation 2. Um, and then I've dabbled in some other ones, and then I played a lot of the PS4, Everybody's Golf and stuff. Um, which which I, I think by that point Camelot was out in those games and it was clap hands um, and I've ironically enough followed them and they've they've done more golf games recently that have been, that have been pretty damn good but um, yeah I've, I've always been curious about playing the PS1 game it is available on PS5 and PS4 by the way <laughs> so if anyone wants to play it that way um, I just I don't know I'm just I really love that N64 Mario Golf that was my game growing up and I've always 
and I'm and and where I started with Hot Shots Golf two, I always thought maybe if I went back to Hot Shots Golf one, I wouldn't like it because it was on like PS one, you know, if that makes sense, <laughs> like going backwards. <laughs> but sounds cool though. I have to I have to check it out. Yeah, I understand the concern because like you are going back to the origin point, and again, it is really simple. Like you know how Mario Golf kind of has charming music and characters like the characters in this i'm not gonna beat around the bush they're fugly they're not they're fucking ugly you know they do not look <laughs> good you know but the courses look fine and they play fine and i, th- I think the little variety there is cool uh like a mini golf challenge that's kind of nice i like all the different modes uh the tournament mode that's pretty cool there is a huge roster so like i'm i'm curious like if you do versus play you can unlock characters but if you do tournament mode you can get a bunch of xp by winning uh, and then uh, I think you could you could play against a friend too, so that's kind of fun. It, it's it's not as robust as as the future you know games, but uh, again, yeah. if you kind of just want some extra like of that golfing style, like this, I think this has you covered. I think you would you wouldn't you would have fun playing it as somebody who likes Mario Golf. Okay. Oh, sorry, it wasn't two. It was um, it was. Three that was on PS2. That's that's the one I played. Hmm. I was looking it up. Um, do, do you know if there's any fun characters unlockable in this one? Because they they do that in the in the later games. Um, like I know uh, four had like Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank, and I think one of them had like yeah, two had Gex and Sweet Tooth from uh, Twisted Metal and stuff. Do you know if there's anything fun in this one? Oh, I'm um, not sure. I mean. You know, when it comes, because this is the only Camelot everybody's golf, so I don't know. Ah, that, that makes sense. You know, um, if you'd have that yeah. same thing that you are seeing in everybody's golf games. But I yeah, I, see, I I'm know. I'm looking at two, two started with clap hands, and then um, that's where the I, it says yeah, the I think the cameo started there because I had Gex and Sweet Tooth and Sir Daniel Fortescue from Medieval. Um, mm. But um, yeah, I'm, I mean, that's cool. I mean, I, I love Camelot. I have to choose. I I'm, I'm I'm trying to decide which which studio I like more, <laughs> Camelot or uh, Clap Hands. Like in terms of their golf games, um, because the Mario golf games, I really like recently that like the like I mean recently being like two years ago that like Switch one came out, the Star Rush or whatever it was, it was called, um, and I didn't really like it that much. Um, but then Clap Hands released the worst golf name I've ever heard. It's um, it's a uh, Easy Come Easy Golf, <laughs> terrible name. But um, they released it, and like it was an Apple Arcade game. Then it got ported to Switch, and it's like half the pr- it's it's you know what it's like a quarter of the price of that Mario Golf game. It's like twenty bucks, and it's like way better than the fucking Mario Golf game. <laughs> so. Um, that's interesting. They're they're both competing on the same platform now. <laughs> they're both golf games. <laughs> yeah, and fighting for worst golf uh, game is not necessarily good because the track record. We started really strong, you know. Oops. When I'm looking at the, it shows the CD or the game cover at the end of this the trailer, golfball. and it looks. No, it's like everybody. It's like a picture of the cast. Oh, the disc they, is, they all just, looks like a golf ball. Oh, I just mean like the game case thing. Okay. Or what I assume is the game case. But that, that just whatever's at the end of the trailer, I guess. Um, and it... The characters look like they're from... Because uh, I know it's Camelot. And it looks exactly like uh, that RPG... On the Game Boy Advance, Golden Sun. Oh, Golden Sun. Golden Sun. Yeah, they all. Yeah, there's there's characters like that in, in the first Mario Golf as well. There's like mm. derpy looking anime people. So. Gotcha. Golf hey, ball. it's a golf ball. <laughs> um, what, do you what's think... the best uh, non Mario golf game? Probably that. <laughs> uh, I like Golf Story. That was fun. I didn't finish it, but I got a good mm, yeah, amount of time yeah. on that. That one, that one was good. Um, I played a bunch because I played some on the NES, and then I I played this other one on Switch. There's one that Playtonic Games did, the ukulele guys, which was fun for a bit, but it gets way too hard. 
And you know, there's Neo like an Turf indie Masters golf game. Neo Geo. Plays. <laughs> what, what's that? I said, sorry, Neo Turf Masters for the Neo Geo. That's my choice. <laughs> there you go. There's like an indie golf game craze right now. Like, I don't even know what. I haven't played any of them, but it's like zombie golf or like, you know, like all these crazy golf games. So I haven't really dabbled. Dude, I have. Many, but I re- as far as the indie I'm pretty sure I have. Great. I'm pretty sure I have like fucking three of them in my Steam account, and I'm I just they've I've got them in like bundles. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I got the Steam account pulled up here on my phone. I have a uh, Golf Club Wasteland, Golf Gang, Science Station, and Golf It. So yeah, there's a big golf thing going on right now. What's your best, Alex? Everybody's like modern. Any. Yeah, every the everybody's golf on PS4. I really like that game. Um, and just recently, like I said, the Easy Come Easy Golf was great. That one has an interesting mechanic. Uh, they they let you choose. You can still do the classic like um, swing mechanic where you have to use the meter. Um, but they actually do something interesting where um, you can actually use the right stick to swing your golf club to like a play. So it's like you go like like a push down to swing back and then you have to hit straight up and you can't hit to the sides or you're, you know, you're going to fuck up your swing. So you have to really get the precision in with the stick. It's really interesting. And, the, and when I first started playing that game, I didn't think I was going to like that. And then I turned out, I liked that more than the meter. Mm. Um, so that was really cool. Um, so that's probably been my favorite golf game recently is yeah. Easy come in, easy golf <laughs> on the switch. <laughs> You know that that's I like name. that you brought that up because I think one thing that hurts this a little bit is that it, it it can feel a little imprecise, not terribly. I like I do feel in control sometimes. Like if I can hit the sliver, actually one of my biggest tips if you're watching is to press before you see. So you press the button before you see it line up with where you're trying to hit because the bar moves so fast. Actually, the thing that threw me off, you know how you can see the bar move. You can see the bar move, but you can't see where you stop it. Which is very bizarre. Like it's a yellow bar. So like when I, I was pressing, I was like, "Huh?" And like, I I was not hitting the ball. I had to keep doing mulligans and practice. But um, yeah. So this this one is it's antiquated, but you you get the hang of it after a game or two of messing up. All right. Fun fun for everyone. Cool. Yeah. PS One classic, dude. <laughs> is it better than Final Fantasy Seven? We, we all know the answer to that, yes. Stay tuned for Final Fantasy Month, coming soon to a button mapper near you. <laughs> God shots golf versus Final Fantasy Seven. <laughs> He's the unlockable, yeah. Is there a way we can do a golf game for Game Talk? <laughs> Ooh, there we go. I, I would love to see uh, Cloud like as a character, but like he uses the Buster Sword as the club. Mm. There you go. Swing as the Buster Sword. Okay, uh, today we are playing some games, uh, or we're talking about some games, and uh, Teddy, what's what's uh, what's your game? Well, likened to the last Discourse video, which was on arcades, which I uh, you know, recommend you guys go watch. It's a nice little nostalgia trip into the arcade era in kind of like our day, but also, I, you know, we'd love to hear what you guys think about the arcade. I did Ice Climber, which is... Very arcade-like, but also a home console game. Mm-hmm. You ever played Ice Climber? I have very little experience with it. Um, I'm more familiar with like the little, um, like whatever, like 30-second demo they let you play on Smash Bros. Brawl. Uh, remember those? Whenever they mm-hmm. had those on there, um, I, th- I think that was one of them. And I think I, I did play a little bit on there, but I've never actually sat down and played a full game mm-hmm. of Ice Climbers. Yeah, you know, or, or tried to at least. So. You know, I kind of rushed it this week to find a game to play because I, I haven't finished a couple of the bigger games that I've uh, played. But I, I downloaded Ice Climber on the Switch online service. It's not actually one through the um, NES online. It's oh, actually it's the Arcade Archives. Arcade Archive, which, which has is a couple also, unique features. It's Sorry. also what my game is, is too, is through the Arcade Archives. So we, we follow the same trend. Well, look at that. It's the Arcade Archive edition. <laughs> Uh, okay, I so think what, there's what are some the interesting things about the fact that it's Arcade Archive because it's not just the standard arcade game. They give you some modes. They give you, like, I think the main ones here are, like, high score modes. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty interesting. Um, I got to admit, I was a little underwhelmed with this one. How do you play Ice Climbers? 
What's, what's the what's the game about? So there are 24 maps, interestingly enough, but I don't think any of them are really map worthy. There's layers, um, one through approximately 10, I think, on each map. And there's different challenges to get to the top. You have to jump like on top of clouds that are moving from right to left. If you've ever played Mario Bros, not the Super Mario Bros, it has that similar kind of our favorite word aesthetic where you go from like left to right on the wall and then you end up like on the other side of the screen. Mm, okay. Is that the same like game feel as Mario? You know how like they're kind of uh, like slippery? Yes, very slippery. In fact, some slopes, I, I don't even know if you can call them slopes because they're all horizontal, but some of the platforms that you're sliding on intentionally will push you a certain way. Some are icy, so you literally slide on them. Some of them I just don't understand. Like, I don't understand why some of them are, like, conveyor belts that move only one way. I don't understand why a cloud appears from the left side of the screen and then goes to the right. But I guess that's the the classic style. I don't really mind that. I, I always thought that was kind of cool how, like, you know, your Mario guy could be, like, on the left and then the right. But Yeah. Um, I just I, I feel there's a couple maps in here. You have to like jump up and like hit the platforms, which is how it's kind of similar to the way that Mario Bros plays um, in like the jumping mechanics. The jumping's not smooth at all. It's really hard to kind of force your diagonal jump. And sometimes you need to break a block and then maybe it's just a cloud underneath you. And then if you fall back through one of the platforms after you've escalated a certain amount, your guy will die. Um, if you touch an enemy, you die. Now you can swing your hammer and try and hit at him <coughs> or even with uh, some of these pterodactyl looking things, which is a cool creature, I guess, for the um, Ice Climber Mountains. You can jump up with your hammer and bop him in the face and then, you know, crush him. But you only get two lives in whichever mode you pick. So you use your two lives and then that's it. You know, Ice Climber's done. Is there anything you that really stood out for you, uh, stood out from this title that you really liked? I like a couple things actually, um, and I'm going to refrain from aesthetic, but uh, it is <laughs> a good looking game. Um, you know, every layer of the mountains are, you know, color coded, which is kind of cool. Some are brown, some are green, some are blue. Uh, I like that it's challenging. I just wish it was a little more balanced. I guess that might make it a bit more fun. There is some two player mode, but I, I find it very hard to ask someone like when they're over, Hey, would you like to play some ice climber? No, <laughs> like the, <laughs> I would say no. Um, I would probably play a handful of other games before I play ice climber with them, which I wonder, like, I wonder what it's like, you know, playing two player ice climber. You both like racing to get to the top of the mountain. I'd have to see it. I also like, um, what do I like? I like that at every, once you escalate the mountain, there's a bonus stage where you, it plays like the classic ice climbers jingle. All right, I could do this for a while. That's, but anyways, that's pretty good. You get 30 seconds to hop on the clouds make it to the top of the platform, collect whatever fruits are there and get bonus points, eggplants, peppers, whatever they are. Uh, for whatever reason, there's eggplants on a mountain. And you have to jump into the arms of a pterodactyl and that will clear the bonus stage and get like 3,000 points for it. I like that idea of bonus points and arcade. On the Switch itself, there's the online leaderboards, which is a really cool feature. And... You know, say you downloaded Ice Climbers, I could probably see what your score is and then we could compare. And nice. I think, I think that would be like a fun little, you know, arcade challenge. But I think that the, the, the feel, the arcade feel is there. It's fun. There's also the challenge of like how many of these maps can I complete before I need to uh, put another credit in and, you know, get the continue. Because you get like literal stamps on every map that you clear. Nice. I I always like the uh, the way like old Nintendo arcade games look. Like I know I've downloaded a couple of them, like Donkey Kong and DK Junior. Um, even though I, ha I have access to the NES versions, but you know, like just because the arcade versions always have like a different feel um, than the console versions. So 
Uh, I'd be interested in trying the arcade version of Ice Climbers. Mm -hmm. It's a little stiff, and there's a couple maps that I think are not fun. I just I, I would like it if there was like some more platforms, and I wasn't like getting caught up on them. Or sometimes the platforms are too many, but I think you should try it. It's an interesting look at like a game that's over 30 years old. Cool. Aesthetic. <laughs> Aesthetic. <laughs> Aesthetic. <laughs> yes. Oh, but I did want to say I think eight dollars might be asking a bit much for this. I'm not really sure. That yeah, all the arcade arcade titles are around. You know, it's like seven seven ninety nine. Yeah, and uh, I think and if you're paying tax, like yeah, I don't know like, for eight dollars. Like you know, you used to get these NES games for five. So I guess yeah. it's arcade or whatever, and that they're like doing a little reworking to it. But you know. Mm. It, it it depends on the title for me, like you know, like and the same thing, like the Sega Ages are about the same price, um, so I you know I don't, I I guess in that you know in that front I don't really mind as much. It's just you know the quality of the game you're getting. Like I just try to make sure I'm I'm, I'm getting something I know I'm gonna like. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why when I was looking at the arcade games, I I really did try and pick one that I thought would be, you know, a good match for my style. And I don't mind having Ice Climber, but at the end of the day. I, I am kind of looking for something a little more. But you know what? I, I have to give it credit. It does have its replay value in terms of uh, the arcade authenticity and high scores and whatever. And if we, you know, compete online, you know, I'd love to, to see where you stand <laughs> on the mountain. Stand on the mountain. <laughs> the ice mountain. Yeesh. How far can you climb? <laughs> uh, well, and uh, Smash Bros. characters. They are they're Smash Bros. characters, so that's neat. I, the first time I played this was in Animal Crossing. Oh, yeah? You used to be able to collect NES yeah. games on the GameCube. That's a feature they desperately need to bring back. Maybe not. They don't have to bring it back, but I would love it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, that That's a nice little footnote. It was the first game I got after Clue Clue Land. Uh... Yes, I, I got the fucking Clue Clue Land NES machine, uh... and uh, it all went downhill for no me. No wonder. No wonder. Yeah. No wonder the resentment, right? It's just yeah. it's, it's age old. Wow. I'm sorry. Wait, Dave. wait for the arcade archive. Clue, clue land. It's it's there. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. No. It's it's on there. Don't tell me this. I don't it's on there. You, you can go. You I'm can go pay eight dollars for it. Down. I can't hear you. <laughs> oh Lord. Okay, I'm gonna turn the volume back up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Best Resident Evil. Yeah. I go next. I want to go next. Yeah. I feel like I'm falling asleep. Hey. Um. So there's been a game I've been playing with Spencer. I'm very excited. I'm not finished, but I'm towards the end, and I think Fabrilon will like this pick. It is. The fifth entry in a series that him, I, and Spencer, and even Alex to some extent, really like. And that is Dragon Quest V. Oh. I'm just at the very end in Nadiria, in the underworld. And it is a game I've not finished before, but I've come very close many times. And uh, Spencer and I are playing it for his channel, RPG Archive. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm on Dragon Quest sabbatical. So I'm trying to enjoy all of these Dragon Quests. And uh, this is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. I would have picked something different, um, but it's just time has not been on my side, and I've not been able to play much, and uh, I'm not far enough into SMT5 enough to comment on it. Um, but Dragon Quest V is terrific. I've been playing it on the DS, and um, it is... A, first off, Dragon Quest is, in fact, a series where it's set in a world where there's kind of like a dark magician overlord who's kind of like... Uh, aiming to take over the world and it's set in this kind of medieval fantasy where you go out with your warrior class party members and uh, go on this grand adventure where the plot begins to unfold itself to you. And um, Dragon Quest IV, I think, in my opinion, was where the series started to make uh, great changes in terms of narrative scope and V is the realization of that. Five very much follows in the footsteps of four, where um, the o dark overworld is, this is years later after the first entry in the Zenithian trilogy, where um, he is looking for children who are prophesied uh, to eventually take him down. 
And that just so happens to put you in his trajectory, although not really in some senses because he sees royalty first and eventually paths interlope. The game is a massive commentary on themes such as tragedy, family, relationships, and monsters. And there's some really good monster taming in the game <laughs> as well. Uh, and it's, you know, I think in some regards, in terms of gameplay systems, it is a bit more rudimentary than future entries, than Pokemon even to some extent. But I think it's still a classic RPG. It is one of very few games that have been an emotional experience for me. And uh, I, I've kind of loved that about this game and this series. And even though I hadn't finished it the last time, a lot of the moments really stuck with me. And even seeing them again unfold has been a really beautiful experience. The orchestrals are fantastic. Every time you go into a cave, uh, the the classic kind of royalty theme music, bum, 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 dun, 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 dun. Da, da, da. it's kind of iconic in a sense as with um you know the the music the monsters the characters the choices and uh, i love it for that so i am really digging my time with dragon quest 5 i'm excited to um finish the game and to continue my quest with uh dragon quest did you say common terry oh you did <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of people attribute uh, Dragon Quest V as the best story in the series. Do you, I have a couple questions on that. How do you think, or well, do you think it is so far? And uh, how do you think it handles story in Dragon Quest in general? And uh, how do you think it compares to other RPGs that you've played? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I want to clarify the ones I've finished at this time. It is one, two, three, four, seven. Um, and then monsters and uh, rocket slime, and um, I'm like I'm right at the end of five, so five is going to be on that um, list. I've also come very far in eight, and maybe like ten hours into eleven. Um, it's hard for me to quantify if the story is better than ones I haven't finished or made enough of a dent into. Um, I think it's a very compact RPG and uh, storytelling, narrative-driven experience in terms of turn-based RPGs in a way that other turn-based RPGs don't tend to be. This is roughly maybe 25 or 30 hour game, um, whereas most RPGs tend to go into the 40 or 50 hour territory. Um, I think I really like it because like a lot of turn-based RPGs fall into this kind of Japan trope, like the personas or you know um, SMTs or like kind of like the anime-esque in like Final Fantasy. And um, I tend to, to turn off a little bit when that happens. Persona is a different story, but um, I do think it is kind of like anime-esque in a sense. And I think that is a bit of a trope um, versus I think Dragon Quest is just like a really well-made game. It's a really well-conceived story. The impact of like certain decisions that happen. I think you really do uh, get like, even though he's a silent protagonist, I happen to love um, just his, like his identity is formed through the relationships with like your father with your um, wife, with Bianca at the beginning of the game, with Harry, Prince Harry. There's even moments like where you just see like sub stories that like, not necessarily they're sub quests, but they're sub stories that have like a really significant impact. Georgie Porgy. You know, like, I don't like know if that name means anything to you guys at like the last time you played it, but you know, like just seeing that happen and seeing how it fits into like the grand scheme about like what's happening with like the quest to find the, the true hero, the legendary hero. And I think they're fun with it. Like, this is really fun. And it's fun with puns, you know, how they always give these man monsters, like, you know, funny names. Like, um, but also um, just in terms of, like, uh, plot lines. Like, you're not the legendary hero your son is. So, like, spoiler alert, I guess. What about a Dr. Agon? <laughs> Dr. Agon. Classic. <laughs> Dr. Agon. <laughs> like they weren't even trying. Yeah, some, of, some of them are laughable. Um, other ones are good. Like brews of ooze or something i don't know but you know you get the picture i love that every monster that you tame gets a nickname you know they get like one of like three or four nicknames so they have yeah. not only do they, they have like four different names for each one which is kind of cute mm -hmm. <laughs> heel slime is mckeel it's not even michael's M mickey al <laughs> yeah <laughs> so good i mean i could have That's a million great. questions for you on this and i will <laughs> but, but, but I don't want to take up all the time on this one. I actually have a question on that. So, um, have you watched the Dragon Quest movie, Your Story? No. Yes. We all three did. <laughs> we, we did a Discord uh, server and we watched it. 
Oh, that's cool. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you want my thoughts? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was with it until it became a you're in the movie type of thing. Yeah. Uh, I was I was gonna ask Teddy, at the end of the game, whenever you find out you're in a simulation, like how like how does that work on that? <laughs> Haven't gotten to that part yet. And one I of the probably more, never will. One of the more unique SNES experiences, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you find out you're in a simulation in in the future of a Super Nintendo game and it's it's like it predicts its own like its own like it's only people in Japan things. because it was only on the Super Famicom, so we weren't even treated to that kind of, you know, yeah. meta yeah. experience. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, now, as a, a person, because I am, uh, that, person. That, that's only really play. That, that only really play. Alex the robot, as a human. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that I have human emotions, um, <laughs> and that I am a human. Um, now, um, I've only really played, like, su- 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 put time into 11. And I am I am wanting to go back and play 8, because you gave me a copy of 8. Um would five be a good place to jump in? Do you feel like um, that would be a good starting yeah. point for, for people? Yeah. yeah, I would say so. Personally, I would say the best way, the best points to jump into Dragon Quest if you're new, I would say either eight or eleven. Personally, at least. But five is a good place to start because really you don't have to play Dragon Quest games chronologically. So. Yeah. I First mean, you one I ever. Mm-hmm. You don't need to play four to enjoy five. Right, yeah. Although it, it does have some bearing on um, well, uh, yeah, there is the there is the Zenithia thing, but other than that, it's its own thing. It's not true because, in the sense that the Dark Magician or like the the kind of um, what was it, the theory of evolution or whatever, like they were they started Ragnar's chapter by abducting kids, you know, and that's still very much a theme even from the first Ghost Town that you go into in Dragon Quest Five, and even uh-huh. throughout like the other sagas. Hey. So you know, having played these back to back, I do see a bit more semblance between um, the games. Okay. There, there okay. is. There's some There's some joint themes, but I'm with more of uh, Fabrillon on this. I, I I don't think you... Don't I, need it. I think course, it's very, very light. On the... <laughs> you look for it, it's there. It's not yeah. just like, oh, there's a sword in this yeah. one and this yeah, one and yeah. that one. It is a little bit more detailed than that. So I just think yeah. it's a disservice to say that there is no connection. My uh, answer to the entry point question is actually, I have like five entry points that I would recommend to people. And it depends on what you're in it for. If you're in it for the history of the, of kind of turn-based RPGs or RPGs, I say Dragon Warrior 1. If you're in it for gameplay systems, I almost say Dragon Warrior 3, oh, yeah. or maybe even Dragon Quest 7. Um, Dragon Warrior 3 was my first one on the Game Boy Color. And I think that one has excellent uh, party building sets. If you're in it for um, just like a compact, quick story, Dragon Quest V, it's a really beautiful experience. If you're in it for more of a 3D experience, probably Dragon Quest Eight or Dragon Quest Eleven. But that's like five Dragon Quests I would recommend to people for different reasons. So it depends what you're in it for. I'm stupid. I, I actually have Dragon Warrior on, on NES, and I've played that. I, I often forget forget that that's Dragon Quest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good because game. Because the box of that game's awesome, and then I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then I see like the rest of Dragon Quest, and it's like Akira Toriyama, which to me feels like anime, by the way, Teddy. Um, and I see that, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Dragon Quest. But then I see the Dragon Warrior NES game, and I'm like, oh, shit, this dude's gonna fucking slay this dragon. <laughs> you know, it's funny you, you talk about the anime part. I was gonna mention this with that, with Teddy's thing, but um, they they specifically went out of their way to make it the game as little anime as possible. Despite the fact that the artist is Akira Toriyama. It, when I see his artwork, I just see anime, though. That's just me, personally. That's sure, just, but if that, yeah. that artwork is solely relegated to the box, for the most part, with these first yeah, like true. six that's games. Hmm. Chrono Trigger is more anime than Dragon Quest. That's true. It's a hot take. It's true. PS1 though. forward. Chrono Trigger is basically a playable anime. I didn't think it was funny that... that how dare you? <laughs> I didn't think it was funny that... No, Persona is the play later. But I thought I thought it was interesting <laughs> that you mentioned that that you thought Final Fantasy was pretty anime. Because I don't think it's that anime until they, they kind of get more Seven, tropey yeah. as it like maybe ten on or something. I don't know. But yeah. but it really isn't that eight. You oh maybe eight because it's more like anyway, yeah. I don't want to talk about eight. That just Yeah, nine maybe is is kind of like going back to roots. But it, it's yeah. hard for me to speak because I'm not a Final Fantasy fan. Mm-hmm. It's just what I see on the outside. But it definitely the anime community really grabbed that one because it was so popular. 
but but it really isn't that anime until they started like grasping onto that and being like okay our community likes this <laughs> so now it's a little more that way seven oh yeah the first like six games are not anime at all <laughs> yeah i agree there maybe i owe him a try i don't know yeah dragon quest <laughs> it's v <laughs> yeah dragon quest v I'm gonna start pronouncing the uh, Roman numerals like like letters. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys played Final Fantasy? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't wait till the Dragon Quest two best games. Three hundred tomato juice. Yeah, <laughs> Dragon Quest V eight. <laughs> that no, that's the race. Babylon knows what that is. <laughs> It's been a great episode, guys. I just want to say thank you. Bye. I'm going to go draw on my Nintendo DS. What am I going to draw, you might ask? Well, there was, uh, the DS was a time and a place. The DS was a time and a place where elderly people played Sudoku. And youngins played Mario. Sudoku. <laughs> the time Sudoku uh, beat Frieza. <laughs> played kirby canvas curse this is a game that intrigued me for a while and i recently got this pretty cool uh pack which i i highly recommend to 3ds owners and ds owners it's 208 and one uh and it's got like a bunch of games on there it was me some of the trouble of, you know hurting and stuff um kirby Canvas Curse is intriguing because it only uses the stylus. And Kirby is a ball. He doesn't even have arms and he they got chopped off at some point. You know, I thought this was a kid's game. But uh That's pretty metal. In this game, tell me about it, man. I had that is metal, my phone's man. <laughs> Not to approve. You use the stylus to draw rainbows to make it more metal. Uh, guide Kirby on this path. You can also tap Kirby and um, absorb enemy power-ups, and those power-ups usually are things that help you progress through the level. Um, there are eight stages, eight worlds with three stages. I think there's more for completionists. Um, and the goal is to get through, like, from start to the next door, and then another phase to another door, and then, like, the final phase, which is, like, a rainbow mirror. Uh, I think I like this game conceptually, but it proved a little bit frustrating because getting the physics of Kirby following the actual stylus drawings were just not very precise. Uh, you could do things like have Kirby go upside down up the drawings. You would tap him to make him move and then he'd have to go up stylus. And I think that's cool and it's fine. And, you know, when it works, it works well. But one of the hard things is that if Kirby's not rolling or if you didn't tap an enemy first, they'll do damage to you and Kirby has like four health. So I found myself dying quite frequently and some of like the final stages were almost unplayable. <laughs> I was in a world on stage seven. I'd gotten through the whole thing. I'd used all three of my lives to get to the final portion. And there's like an anti-gravity section where Kirby's like rotating around things that are pulling him in all di different directions. You have to press a green button and a purple button. And then in order to get to the mirror, and I got finally down to the mirror section and I accidentally bumped into like a sword guy. And, and I was like, my life. And I was not going to restart that stage. So this was one of those like games that like, I think it has so much style. It has so much potential. In fact, this is what Rainbow did on the Wii U and I think that game was pretty well received I've even tried that and enjoyed that I just think you need like extreme amount of patience and willingness to learn the systems another thing that was really frustrating was like water sections I don't know if water sections in a video game have ever pissed me off as much as they have here because Kirby just floats to the surface and you need to draw the stylus thing going down and make manage to get him to bump back into the thing it was weird because you had to draw like lines to stop mirrors or to like stop you know rays so it's just there's a million things going on in your mind at once as you're trying to get Kirby from one end of a stage to another uh I don't know if I think if I was like more patient and this was like the only game I owned I would probably uh be more into it but the I just for context the range of either beating this game to completing this game is either four hours or 17. 
want to get everything, you need to put in like four times the amount of time. It's just you, like, I hope you have time to, and are willing to like take your time with it. We canvas curse. Uh, however, you said, you said between four to 17 hours. What if it's four times four? What if it's 16 hours to complete the game? Beat the average. It to a hundred percent. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Did did they? Okay, so I haven't played the original Canvas Curse, but I've played Rainbow Curse. Do they actually explain why he's a ball in this one? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention to that. Oh, okay. Because in Rainbow Curse, they don't like the and in, in Rainbow Curse, it's like oh, uh, evil and the no light and stuff in the world, and then now there's a magic paintbrush, and Kirby's like. I'm a ball now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I was really curious if like they actually had like an explanation of why he's just a ball. Look it up for you. I'm hoping it's very traumatic. Yeah. It's games yeah. like like that, like Canvas Curse, that put me off of Kirby for so long. Because I I I, I mean, obviously, I've made it no, no secret. I do not like gimmick controls. Oh yeah, and there's gimmick gimmick Kirby games everywhere. Yeah, all these gimmicks. I'm like, I, every so it came to a point where every time I'd see a new Kirby game coming out, I'd be like, oh, another gimmick game. Cool. I'm sort of the same way. Like, I didn't play this one. I didn't play Tilt and Tumble. I didn't play uh, Mass Attack because it's the same way where you like touch a thousand Kirby's. <laughs> yeah. I think those were <laughs> more traditional, though, and that was what put me off of like the other ones on the DS. Versus, I thought that Power Paintbrush was intriguing. Unfortunately, intrigue doesn't really carry a game; like, it actually has to be pretty competent. Some games, I think, as long as they're manageable. This one was like mostly manageable, but like, you know, also an exercise in frustration. So, meh. Got a plot for you. Oh, yeah, let's hit me with. Lay it on us. One day, a strange portal appears in the sky, and out of it comes the witch Drossia. Drossia mm. casts a spell over You're Dreamland, turning it into a world of paint. Mario paint. Upon fleeing back into the portal she came through, Kirby gives chase, finding himself in Drossia's paint-themed world, which curses Kirby, turning him into a ah. limitless ball. See? There is a reason. He's cursed. Is Rainbow on, Curse actually a, a sequel to Canvas Curse? Well, yeah, but <laughs> only only in gameplay, only in our hearts. Mm. Plot. The touch screen. And <laughs> I mean, I don't mind the touch screen, but like, that's the whole like you can't use any buttons or anything. Like, I could see how that could be off. Well, that was the DS's thing towards the beginning. It was like every game wanted to do that. Zelda did that. Kirby did that. Yoshi did that. Like, there's a ton of games that are just like, she's going to use touchscreen now. <laughs> that was so annoying, dude. When the DS first came out, why the games are like Super Mario 64 DS? You got a top where you want to go? Yeah. Dude, what the heck? It's a it's... definitive version, by the way. Mario, Mario nah. Hoops 3 on 3. It's kind of genius in a way uh, because they built. They built like a a thing that you. It's very hard to emulate at least a hundred percent, because like some of the ones they built there, like where you have to blow into the microphone. Exactly, that's what I was thinking about, <laughs> dude. When like oh. Mario Party and Zelda Phantom Hourglass, when you gotta blow, when you gotta turn. Beer trash. Uh, that too. Yeah, it's horrible. It, yeah, they just were exploiting every gimmick. Like, listen, if you want to do that with like a crossword or Sudoku. Fine. You know, I can take my time with that. But when it's like a game where Kirby's on autopilot and it's like, <laughs> I have this much time to draw a thing over a spike in a limited paint supply and then like a spike thing coming at me and then like I have to get to the door or the buttons in an anti-gravity like system with water. That. <laughs> Kirby's supposed to be chill, you know, and this was not wow. chill. Cool. Well, um, I'm here today to talk to you about Shantay. No, no. Uh, so, yeah, can I go next? I don't care. Yeah. Spencer? Yeah. Guys, it's been hard lately. Um, I, been a you know, hard it's knock summer, life. summer break. I'm not working. Hard knock life. 
Uh, you know, I'm for just looking for more, for more money. And uh, do you guys know of any part-time work opportunities? I don't know. I'm scared. What did you play? <laughs> Is that a no? Did you play Paperboy? I played part-time UFO. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, I was thinking either that or that like good job game that like no put out. <laughs> oh, job simulator? No, <laughs> no, 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 not that. It was like good, good job, whatever. You're like in office building, but you play part time UFO. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this is a game by Hal Laboratory. First came out on the Android and iPhone in 2017 slash 2018, uh, which I found a little bizarre. You know, these are the guys that make Kirby and Box Boy also on the 3DS, uh, both of whom make cameos in this game. Uh, it was this year that it came out on the Nintendo Switch. Oddly enough, there was no trailer for it on the Switch. It's probably the only game when you go to the game. There's just one image, and it has its own special coloring, like a, like kind of a baby blue. So it looks really cute. It's got this very cute uh, kind of Kirby look. It's funny. Kirby actually turns into a UFO in certain games that you play, <laughs> and this is kind of resemblant of that. And I knew very little about it. I read a review in a Nintendo Force magazine where they were singing its praises, saying it's a kind of a UFO crane game where you control a crane that drops down and then you move items and you have to like complete these uh, tasks. Uh, it's a task oriented game. And essentially you play as, I think the character's name is like UFO ski or something like Broski, but a UFO. Uh, so UFO ski. I like a Russian. <laughs> I am UFO ski. <laughs> yeah. I come to take your jobs. <laughs> and uh, he's out of work. And so you actually start the game as a farm hand and you, the, the farmers dropped his crates and you bring the crates into his truck and then you make a salary based on that. And then you come home and the UFO is like reading a newspaper and there's a section like part time work. And that's the main section. You play part time missions for work that you can use to upgrade your UFO. They're very shallow on the in terms of like a kind of overall purpose and scheme of what you're doing. Like Mario is like save the princess. Uh, Kirby is like save dreamland. The UFO ski is like, I need work. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so there are some cool costumes that you can get with the money that you make from completing these uh, variety missions. Uh, and, you know, there's even like one cameo, of, like you could do a box boy style UFO. Some of them are functional, too. It's not just like for in terms of how you look. I have this witch outfit. It makes me go a lot faster. Um, pretty cool. It's like UFO on a broom. And uh, I wanted. It, yes, it's pretty cool. So there's some selection there. I wanted to like this game more, but I think I just don't like crane physics. Like, mm. if you, you guys, what do you guys think of crane games? Oh, like I'm, in person? I'm stupid good at them. Are you? Yeah, I was the true. Okay, so I've I, I actually used to play them all the time and like win toys okay. and stuff. Like I had a shit ton of toys that I would like um there for a little bit. A lot of them we folded like the little Angry Bird plushies and I had a shit ton of Angry Bird plushies that I won from these things. Mm -hmm. Uh there I, I actually have a funny story. Um uh, I was um chilling out at a Walmart one time. I was just like hanging out. I was I, I think I was waiting for somebody to, like to like pick me up at their in like I was just like hanging out in, like like the little lobby area and there's a crane machine there and I remember there was this really cute girl that walked in and I was like her and like a little brother was like wait or you know whoever's in was like a little brother was like waiting for you know the for their turn on like the crane game and I was sitting there and I was I put like a dollar in and I and I was like vroom, vroom, and I just fucking like I I won two bears at one time it was like like grabbed them both and they're like vroom, and it dropped them and she was like oh my god how did you do that and I just like turned around and I was like you can have both of them I don't want them <laughs> I was like I was just bored <laughs> so she was like oh my god thank you and then um. She worked at, at a restaurant nearby, and every time I would go into the restaurant, she'd be like, It's you! <laughs> <laughs> so that was like my funny story with a crane. Yeah, no, I, I haven't played them in a while, but I used to win stuff in crane games all the fucking time. Okay. This one is not set up like that. It's not like a, you, you play it, you win. Everyone is task oriented, yeah. and uh, you won't be getting two items at once. The crane is not going to work that way, they're too far separated from each other. Uh, so, you know, some things might, uh, the, the tasks might range from like building dinosaur from like fossils in a museum to helping as a farm hand. Some of these things repeat, uh, you might play in a lab, you might be asked to do a kind of like Tetris puzzle style thing. And, um, I found them like it was the, the mechanics were weird. You would drop the crane, you'd pick up the item and it would just naturally swing from right to left with a kind of wobble, even if you weren't moving. 
And to get the items to position, you would be asked to do these things like stack five cheerleaders and they'd all be standing there bouncing and, you know, like you have to like set them up on top of each other in mm -hmm. like a little, uh, like a platform. Uh, you could clear the mission, but it doesn't matter if you don't do it in the time limit. You might get like a minute and a half to do it. And getting these things to stand up right without just like falling over, I just found it incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. It was actually cool because it makes you like pay attention to it. But at the same time, uh, it was an exercise in frustration trying to complete these things because you would need to either complete it in the time limit or complete hidden objectives like finding a secret item or stacking a, an extra item on top or doing it a certain way, getting them all to line up a certain way in order to get stars. And you need more stars than just one permission in order to get to the next set of three missions. I had played about 14 missions. I had 18 total. I don't know how many there were in total. I was just bored i was tired i didn't even get to the kirby one um and also the music was driving me insane it was just so repetitive uh mm. here's here's kind of like a it's if you guys this is whistling like the the, the actual sound effect wow. uh, yeah. now play Damn. that in your head over and over for 30 minutes oh sick you'd like it uh, have you played Box Boy? I wish it's cheap enough. I would get it. Okay, I wasn't sure because I I had a question about this because like how laboratories they're really good at taking a really simple concept and like sort of stretching it as far as they can. Uh, Box obviously, Boy looked simple and and kind of enjoyable in that puzzle aspect. I like puzzle games. You know, I'm I'm into yeah. them. Uh, I play the the crossword. I play Sudoku. You know, that's that's my thing. So, but uh, this one is is not like a simple puzzle game. Okay. If that makes sense. The physics work against you. Is it the point though? Is the point is that they need to work against you? Yeah. I mean, I didn't like, I would obviously expect it to be challenging, but I wouldn't expect it to be super frustrating. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it, like, you know, I like the crane game in Mario party. Mario Party One, where you pick up like, the Why? and Why? That's terrible. If you're playing that game, you're you're losing because there's no way you can win. <laughs> I I win at that one against other other players. Oh, not if you get picked up, but if you play the crane in that one, I enjoy it in that one. I feel I have a good degree of control. I don't feel like I have enough control to the point where I'm in control. And for a game that has kind of a cutesy kind of look to mm. it, that's not what I was hoping for. You can do uh, co-op. I didn't try it. Ooh, but. that's cool. Hmm. Man, I, I that's disappointing that you didn't really like it. This game, I like the, I love the art style I'm looking at here. And again, and they, I think they do a good job making things look good with limited, not resources, yeah. but limited, limited um, colors and limited stuff. Detail. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. Detail. Like the UFOs yeah. look really slick. I like the eyes. It's a very HAL design. Can mm -hmm. you check out the backgrounds, though? Because some of the backgrounds look like they came straight out of a Flash game. Well, if they're built for phones, then they probably yeah. did. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're a little, they're a little Flash. Like the Kirby oh, yeah. one, they use that as like the kind of like the picturesque one because like, oh, it's Kirby and everything. But you might see like these kind of like, uh, like these things look like they were drawn with a crayon, like the this farmer in the background. And they're looking at you like, huh? But... There is some interesting interaction between the the foreground and the background if you're going for like hidden objectives. I do like how it kind of tries to make you think like, uh, what is the hidden objective? All they'll give you as a hint is a picture, and so you have to kind of figure out what how does this picture correlate. It doesn't end up being too difficult after you play the mission because it's like, oh yeah, there was a beach ball there, and I could have done it at this point. I like this one with fishing. Like, there's one point where the squid will jump out of the water, and then like you catch a squid. Mm -hmm. So there's some unique challenges. But uh, again, I, I think it was just. Uh, it was not what I was hoping for. Mm. I, was, I, pay, I was picking between this and a short hike and uh, picking a game to purchase. I kind of wish I went with a short hike. You just actually take a hike. Um, I almost feel bad for some companies like like Hal or also uh, Game Freak I know has tried and so has Good Feel. Uh, this, this, these companies that mainly work with Nintendo, I, I feel bad for them because... A lot of them try to branch out and try to make newer, different games, and it's it's almost like they they live in that shadow of Nintendo at, at this point. That they're like it's too hard. I think the Box Boy might be the most successful one I've seen, and um, because 
you know, I've seen, you know, of course this, I've seen Game Freak. They've, they've done like, they did like the Timbo, the badass elephant. And, um, was that t- village town thing that they made for the, like, like little town thing, uh, that they, they made did for the Switch. Pulse Pulse Man or something way back in the day. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pulse man. They, they did alt wrecker. I think it is called. Mm. And then good, good feel late, recently did a uh, monkey barrel, which is a really good mm-hmm. shooter. But I, I think these companies that mainly work with Nintendo, I've seen them try to branch out beyond that. And it's, it hasn't worked out for any of them, really. It really looks uh, like this didn't because it came back to Nintendo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm mm. saying. It's almost like they had to come back to Nintendo to be like, look, it's the Kirby guys, you know, making a UFO game. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it might be right for you. I would just be ready to experience an exercise in uh, wacky, wonky crane physics if wacky wonky crane physics if that's your thing. yeah <laughs> i like that it seems to have sort of well, just the way you described it i'm not i can't see it but it has sort of a katamari almost sense of humor like stacking cheerleaders on top of each other mm. it's kind of funny yeah it does it does have that same kind of look to it yeah as somebody who likes crane games i am actually semi-interested in playing it yeah take um, a look at the footage i'll clip well you know i've been streaming pokemon lately and i thought what better way to celebrate Pokuary than to boot up my DS and play one of the most popular selling games in Nintendo's lifespan? Nintendo Dogs, best friends. I uh, picked a golden retriever and I tried to name it a Pokemon, something like approximate. So I called it Psyduck. And you have to talk into the DS and say the name of the dog. Is so I'd be like, Psyduck. And then it would turn and be like, woof. And that's when I closed the game and I started playing Pokemon Arceus again because I had played fucking the 10 dogs. There's no secret I've been really digging deep into Pokemon Legends Arceus. Me and Spencer are going to talk about it soon on his channel, RPG Archive. So I don't want to say too much, but I will say this is perhaps my favorite Pokemon game I've ever played. It addresses a lot of the concerns that Brian had brought up about like TMs and HMs. There's none of that. You can change your moves freely from any Pokemon on your team menu. You don't lose them. You can go back to them. There are no TMs. In some ways, it's a more simplified version of your typical Pokemon experience. And also, um, like the 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 ways that it's simplified is like one is the TMs are easier. There's no HMs. You can like ride Pokemon like in various ways. And like this is really like this kind of like it's not totally open world. It's not Breath of the Wild style. But you have like basically like five open areas that you can explore with tons of different Pokemon roaming the land. And you're kind of like a hunter-gatherer. It takes you back to simpler times in the uh, Shino region, which is Gen 4. It's a lot of Gen 4 representation. You start off the game, the first Pokemon you see aside from your starters are Bidoofs and Starlies. You know, dumbest freaking Pokemon. But <laughs> it's just funny seeing it. And Spencer had brought up that to get through this, he had to retrain his brain to like how he plays Pokemon game. And that's very much true. Within the first hour, I had I was like figuring out what I'm doing. Like you're supposed to be going like crouching in grass and throwing Pokeballs at the back of Pokemon when they're not facing you. It's like a stealth game. It's really cool. And it benefits your whole party. You, you should be catching multiple Pokemon. Each one has research entries. You're basically a field researcher. You're discovering the first Pokemon in this world. And you are you have to complete challenges, like find out what they're weak to or see them use certain moves. And it's really rewarding. It's, um, it's rewarding in terms of like XP and stuff for the party. But also, it's just like getting the dex entries. It feels like an earned challenge. It's not, it's, you know, in the previous games, it's as simple as like just catch a Pokemon and then you get the dex entry. No, you have to actually learn about them. Everything feels kind of earned here. Even like finding like a rare Pokemon just wandering the wildlands is really cool. And then I also like this kind of immediacy about it. So, you know, you throw your Pokeball at the Pokemon and then you just catch it and you just move on. There's no nicknaming. There's no read the deck entry. There's no, you know, would you like to fight? There's no cut scenes. It's just fluid action. Now, is there room for improvement? Absolutely. It's, you know, it, you can see there's pop-in effects when you're flying across the terrain and grass starts like appearing on one half of the screen, but not the other. But it's not nearly as bad as Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. 
Another thing is it does use the XP share system. So your whole team is leveling up at the same time. I actually don't mind that because if you turn that off, which I don't think you can, this game would easily stretch out from a 25 hour game to like 100 hours, which are you really playing a Pokemon game for that long? There's like these huge Pokemon on the field. So like I know for Alex, you liked with Sword and Shield, kind of the open area. It's basically that like times five. And it's a really significant game. Arceus has always been kind of like a mythological kind of creature within the series. You couldn't even catch him legitimately in the States in North America because the event was canceled for like Diamond and Pearl and Platinum. Uh, so to have a whole game that's focused on Arceus is actually really significant. I found that this game kind of went under people's radar. Or they just never got it and they never really talked about it. They really focus on mainline games for some reason. But it's really a missed opportunity because I, I or like for fans because... I think it does some of the things the best that I've ever seen in the series. It's just so much fun going around, exploring, finding new Pokemon, catching them, seeing them in action, picking your team. And it's different. It's unique, but I really like it. The time of recording this, I haven't played Scarlet and Violet yet or this game. So I'm curious. Um, I guess my point of reference would be Sword and Shield. Um, but how does the narrative of this game stand up? the current pokemon narratives at least in terms of sword and shield because i i think that's the, <laughs> that game had a bit of a weak narrative <laughs> oh this is a concrete framework it's not that i think you'll make any big attachments to any characters and i mean there are some cliches but i think that the premise is really cool you get dropped out of the freaking sky in the first cutscene, and you end up in this like japanese feudal town and everyone looks at you as kind of a foreigner and so you have this kind of stigma, but you join this like security corps where your job is to help them investigate and research Pokemon to learn to live with them because they're living in fear of them, in f of fucking Bidoofs, you know, like of these stupid beavers. <laughs> and it's funny, but it, it's it's also, it's, it's really like a novelty. And like in the beginning, there's a bit of exposition and like a, a lot to read. I was doing it on stream, so I was reading it aloud, so it actually took longer. But then once that drops, you're basically free to roam. And I think... The premise that you are a researcher is a solid framework. So I, I think narratively it holds up. It's not the most mind blowing. Of course not. It's a Pokemon game, but it's good. Believable, I guess, you know, you know like I can, I can immerse uh, it sounds myself like it in gives this. You, I say it sounds like it gives you more of a reason to care than you know, in Sword and Shield where it's just like uh, your best friend's here and his brother is a guy and now there's an evil dude or something you know? yeah basically there's some of that but it's not to the extent where that's the main freaking thing you're thinking about okay eddie i obviously don't want to ask you too much because we're going to have a little discussion about it but just as an offhand i know you have some interesting opinions what is your thoughts on them talking about this is breath of the wild for pokemon no, uh, definitely. Well, I mean, like you can see the um, t -t 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 you can see the inspiration. Like it's clear that like they adopted or adapted the Breath of the Wild formula, but it also feels formulaic in some extent. So, I mean, one, it's for some reason Nintendo or Game Freak is is getting a little bit lazy with how much money they're actually putting into these. You can see like the frame rate of some Pokemon. Like I think of some like a. Star Ravia flying, and then like you see three frame pixels. You know, it's wing down, wing mid, wing up, wing mid. <laughs> it's, it's really funny seeing that. So from a technical level, I actually don't think it's as impressive. You see Pokemon, like I, I began to notice this after like hour maybe 20 or 30. They're plotted very specifically on the grid. A mm. very specific amount of space away from each other. And you can tell that that's just kind of like, I don't know if that's lazy programming, but it's very specific programming. And then, uh, you know, obviously it's not one big world. You do have to go between worlds, but it's like five big worlds in a hub. So it's not Breath of the Wild per se, um, but I, I also don't think it's trying to be like, get the shrines or pick which path you're going to go. I know, I think this is very much a Pokemon experience. I agree. Any, any questions? Uh, not questions per se, but it seems interesting. I watched a little Teddy stream this, and I, I, I like the look of it. I didn't find the graphics look 
bad. I thought they looked pretty good. And I like the idea that, like Teddy said, you could select what skills you wanted on your Pokemon in the menu. I like that all the time. So it gets rid of the TMs I was talking about. And I like that you said, like, it's like before they learned how to tame Pokemon, they're like all scared of them. I like that kind of aspect of it. So it looked interesting. I wish I could have caught more of it. Yeah, I think it's it's actually really attainable too. Like if you do play a future one, I think this one's honestly worth trying. Uh, there's, you know, I, I didn't finish the simplifications, but there's no held items. There's no abilities. So you don't have to be thinking about all this stuff. It's just the type matchups. Also for you, this is really good. It tells you what moves are effective, super effective or not effective to Pokemon on the field, even if you haven't seen them. I like that. And that's all I want to say for now. On all right, so I played a uh, zombie classic. I usually shy away from these, but I thought I owed it to myself to try and really experience the authentic zombie stuff, especially coming off of uh, Capcom month too. I played Dead Rising, the original, on my Xbox Series S. Disclaimer, I didn't finish. I got to about day two. I, I died plenty of times, actually. And most recently, the clock ran out before I got to the next case file. But I feel like I've got enough experience to talk about what the game is like overall. I have some memories of my friend in grade school having this on the 360 and it being sort of like a Xbox showpiece at the time. Oh, it's a giant shopping mall with zombies and you can kind of run around and pick up anything and attack the zombies and there's a kill counter and you know there is a plot underneath it all frank west is you know dropped off at a shopping mall because this you know they think it's riots but then he gets there and it's zombies i don't know why he thinks he's riots and he's taking pictures of them <laughs> eating their corpses uh, oh is that a riot <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a riot um but it's pretty uh i don't know it's pretty cool, pretty sandboxy, kind of just do what you want as long as you are following the main cases. Uh, there is kind of this idea of like you want to take pictures and, you know, get the scoop on what's going on in Colorado, this zombie situation. And he's like, in order to progress the storyline, you go in with like these detectives and like these other people and trying to see like what's really happening here. At one point you're fighting this uh, this gunman in the little wonderland area or the food court and he's like running across the tops of these uh like these stalls and you know, it, it just becomes like a kind of a wild zany zombie thing I, I think the game doesn't take itself too seriously i think it's pretty funny um with the dialogue i don't think humor is the main point but you know it's i think that's kind of the point of zombie games anyways to be kind of cheesy but don't let that deceive you the game can be really difficult like when you even just start off with the first zombie encounters the, <laughs> the shopping ball floods in with them and they start killing all of these survivors and you get notifications oh lucy's dead oh, oh man. becky's yeah. dead you know like you can't even you can barely save it <laughs> i'm reading the reviews and you know there's like there's a sub quest where you could just go save the survivors a lot of people go into these survivor matches to try and save the survivors and they end up just saving themselves because that's all they're able to do I really like the arcadey and rpg style of it so in the bottom is a, a a kill counter for zombies i was at almost 700 before i had the uh the time out uh, but one thing that helps is if you level up, you can increase your inventory size, you increase your strength, your your health, and things like that. And what's really cool is even if you're like struggling at the beginning, you're level one and you're just playing the game normally, you have the option of either just loading your save file, and you can save frequently at any restroom or any um, little mattress area, or you can start the uh, game over with all of your stats. So you can go in from like i'm at level seven right now if i died i could technically start from day one and go that way it's a little janky so like even in that gunfight i was talking about like you can pick up any weapons and they usually expire and then you have to just keep cycling through weapons uh, so <laughs> you know the gun you're getting in this gunfight and i think his name's carlito or something i, I don't know 
Uh, but he's running both ways, and any time he comes into your line of fire, he's firing an automatic weapon at you, and you can barely dodge these shots. You can oh, kind of good, finesse yeah. it, like where points where you can like be behind a, a block of wood and then you know shooting at him. But even the aiming is weird. Like you're going into like right trigger mode to aim, but there's no reticle. But you or like or it's like a little dot, and you know it's with the handgun. So it, it can be really tricky using a couple of the weapons in the game, but I do think cycling through everything makes it kind of fresh. The game is hard. Once nighttime hits, those zombies get really powerful, so even on that first night. And I think there's kind of a thrill to it, too. Like I and But there's also ways you can kind of maneuver around it. Like one of my hacks is to grab like the big items, like the bench or like a bookshelf, and then just slam like five zombies at once because even when you're... Re retracting you have these invincibility frames so they can't really grab you plus you're taking down a bunch of them at once in a certain point of the game uh like early on they start to drop queen bees so you can drop a queen bee and it'll kill a bunch of zombies in the vicinity and they'll turn into like worms it's gross i know but it's helpful and also you can jump off of zombies backs you can even see what weapons they're holding. Sometimes it's a knife. Sometimes it's a nightstick. If they're a police officer one, sometimes it's uh, a, a hunk of meat and it's somebody's arm and <laughs> even their own and they're just nibbling <laughs> on it and it's gross. And you don't want it. You can just throw it. Uh, one of the pro tips is to kill the clown early on and get the chainsaw. I hear that's a really uh, what? helpful item. Kill the clown and get the chainsaw. What? Kill the clown and get the chainsaw. <laughs> what? You'll figure it out later. You can watch the VOD. Uh, so the chainsaw is really helpful on massacring these zombies. I'm enjoying the game. Will I finish it? I think so. I'm I'm getting there. I'm like a good percentage in. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I played it. Ed Rising. Today keeps going this way. I just might... <laughs> Kill some the chainsaw. What? The yeah. motherfucking chainsaw. That, anyway. That's what Spencer's doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't the, get it. The, the store, uh, Jill's Sandwiches is a reference. Yes, to I was going to mention Jill's yeah. Sandwiches. I was going to ask you if you went to Jill's Sandwiches. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Which part of the, the plaza is it in? I think it's in the, it's in the food court. Yeah. There. It's just like a shop that says Jill's Sandwiches, and it's a joke from the first game where Barry was like, You were almost a Jill Sandwich. <laughs> Is that a uh, joke from the first? Oh, from, from Resident uh, Evil. Yeah, I from Resident Evil. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I didn't see that, but I saw the the Capcom like little Lego looking heads, no, and I oh, started. Those, those are yeah. um, those are serve bots from Mega Man Legends. Oh, yeah. I see. I noticed them from like the Marvel vs. Capcom uh, things. This on the packaging or whatever. So I, you can actually put it on Frank's head, and then even in the cutscenes, he's looking around with this thing. It's pretty <laughs> <Yeah>. funny. <laughs> Uh, there's also a Mega Man film being advertised outside the movie theater. Oh, okay. I, I went to the movie, movie theater. It was a cool little set piece. That's one thing I like about this game is like the exploration. There's not like any movies playing, but it's it's cool to just kind yeah. of run around the the shopping mall's huge. It's not just like one yeah. little area. There's a whole map to it. Yeah. Looks like uh the MKR group who holds the copyright to Dawn of the Dead and the remake. Uh, tried to sue Capcom. Tried to sue Capcom, Microsoft, and Best Buy for some reason for claiming oh, wow. that Dead Rising infringes on their shit. But the I love zombies this. in a mall. Yeah, it's zombies in a fucking mall. I love yeah. this. The, there's a, the judge, Judge Richard G. Seaborg, had to state that uh, they failed to demonstrate the similarity or any protected element of Dawn of the Dead to that of Dead Rising, with many of the elements MKR claimed were similar being part of the wholly unprotectable concept of humans battling zombies in a mall yeah. during a zombie outbreak. <laughs> I love that like some judge like went to school for this. That's so amazing. Just, zombies in a fucking mall. Man. <laughs> like, <laughs> wholly unprotectable concept. Yeah. <laughs> Frank West, he, he's covered wars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, th you know, Dead Rising is funny because it, it it's one of those games that came out early on the 360 where they were like, can't the 360 do these amazing things? And it, and it was, I'm not saying it's a bad game per se. I haven't really played it, but, um, it, it, it almost shows like a, a, a tech demo where back then they were like, let's, before we couldn't do this, but now we can cram like a million enemies on screen and let's, 
let's do it. Mm-hmm. And then you just kind of get to see it. And it's, it's really interesting to see like what, what people were prioritized is really cool back then and, and see how they, how it even performed, like how it worked, which is really neat. Those cut scenes have like their mouth movements are like jarring as they're like talking. <laughs> So this is not like a remaster or anything. I don't think that exists for this first game, but uh, it, remi- it gave me like Fable graphics. Like it's just an HD version. Capcom mm-hmm. did HD versions of the first two games and like the sub games for two because they have like different chapter games and stuff for them. But Re- remaster version came out on uh, July eighteenth, twenty sixteen. Oh, no, no. It still... was announced. It was announced it would come out and was released on September 13th of that year. They were they were just like ports. They were just like $20 ports. Because I remember I got the first one on PS4 mm-hmm. when it came out. and Because I was like, maybe... I, I've never liked Dead Rising, so I was like, maybe I'll like it now. And I still didn't like it. But, you know, but I remember mm-hmm. getting it on when it came out on PS4. Um, yeah, I remember a lot of people when this game first came out, they were... Yeah, it was all like... You, you won't like all my friends are like you won't believe how many zombies are like you can use like a mm-hmm. a, a, a bench and, you know or whatever like pick this up and hit them with it and I was like that sounds cool I don't know what it is I can never get into this game or or mm-hmm. its sequels because mm-hmm. I've tried multiple times yeah, yeah it's well, how... kind of nerve wracking eh. oh, no, sorry go ahead. go ahead no 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 go ahead uh, I was saying it's kind of nerve wracking too like I always want like want to complete everything like and then all these people are. Or wanting you to rescue him on the radio, and then it's it's so hard. I don't think it, you're able to rescue everyone. And then if you die, I think you have to start over at the beginning. But you still have all your of your upgrades. So it kind of gets easier every time you try it. I think it's like a, is it like a seven day cycle or a, seventy two hours? Uh, oh, seventy two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. You gotta always have that main quest in the back of your mind. And I didn't really understand yeah. like the the layout. Like you can look at your watch and then it pulls up the quest. But one thing that sucks is like yeah. even when you're doing that, the zombies are still coming at you. So you gotta really be in a safe space to do that. Right. Um but it has the arrow to tell you where to go, so it's not too confusing. Yeah. Although that arrow is janky too. It because like it doesn't like just generally point to a direction. Like there's like hallways and it'll be like It'll be like ne- moving with you. It's weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going for subquests, and then I completely missed that main quest, and I was like, "Well, yeah. goddamn!" And there's so there's like multiple logs worth of files that you have to complete to go through the game. So I I think that timer thing can throw you off. You um, you don't have to start from the beginning of the game if you die. You do you can load your game. Just oh, that's right. Yeah, that's at. right. Yeah. That's right. I would be curious to see yeah. how this game evolved into Dead Rising Four. Like, I wonder what the difference oh. is. <laughs> I've heard. At the, okay, okay, so I did, I haven't played four. I played two and three. They get progressively goofier mm-hmm. as they go on, and I believe four is just like just like Saints <laughs> Row three levels of stupid, where it's like okay. Frank West is back and he's silly as silly as ever, you know and. Like I, I think like the ultimate edition of four is called Frank's Big Package or something. Like it's, it's, yeah. what I could tell. It just got like goofier and goofier. There's a fifth one now though, right? No, oh. canceled. I think four is the last oh? one. Yeah. Oh, four is, four is the last one they did. Goddamn. It's quite the note to go out on. I never got past the second one. It, re- it was really ner- the the second one really gave me anxiety because not only is it timed, I think you have to your your daughter, you're you're trying to protect your little daughter, and she needs a medication to keep her from being a zombie. So you have to like go give that to her. Like you have to go find a, a med and give it to her every few hours. Like oh man, I can't handle this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you're playing as Chuck Green, yeah. and you can like combine stuff. Yeah. That was the coolest thing about two was like, yeah. you can, like make weapons, yeah, yeah. And, like. You could combine like a paddle with like chainsaws to have like double chainsaws yeah, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, this game is a little more straightforward, I think. Like you can see like food icons and you know weapon icons and whatnot. So and you know you can build your inventory that way. And I think the the frequent like restrooms, you know, you let your load out. No, it helps you save as needed. Looks like the fourth one they got rid of the timer entirely. Oh, good. But apparently brought it back for Frank Rising DLC. Frank Rising? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Frank's Dick Rising. 
Next dick rising. rising. It's for gay month. Hey, wait. The future. All right, Teddy, what you got? Cool, cool land. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quick, I agree. I think Yu-Gi-Oh is a great brand. So I'm glad you picked it. Okay. <laughs> Speaking Your of move, collections, um, actually, before I get to it, I did pick a collection, but uh, I just want to say generally, when people say video games are art, what is the video game that you think of? Oh my god, you didn't do it. Did you, are, you, are you a madman? Let Spencer go first. <laughs> oh god. I don't like that question, but... I'm not or, saying or you statement. have to agree, but like, what's the game you think yeah, of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess... Shadow of the Colossus? I don't know. Okay. Alex? Teddy, did you play Bitrip? Play Bitrip Saga. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Oh, uh, 3DS. And I did it. Well, I, I bought it, you know, it was affordable. The other one on Wii has gone up in price. It's like fifty, sixty dollars or something. And I have it with the soundtrack, you're welcome. Oh, okay. Um, so I I got it because like five, six years ago, Alex was like really trying to sell me on Bitrip. He's and we had this whole video games or art discussion, discourse, debate, whatever you want to call it. Whatever you call them. I um, did a video. Columns is art. Correct. Uh, correction. Um, but yeah, I played Bit Trip Saga. And, you know, um, it's not the most important point to bring up that discussion, but uh, I just kind of wanted to tickle Alex's fantasies since we're already getting there. Um, <laughs> the reason I, I kind of mentioned that is, like, on a surface level, this is a collection of, like, arcade style indie games. And I think that's underselling it because when I say indie, I don't think of anything great. Um, but uh, this is like kind of the step up from in indie, m maybe like at the quality level of like like Limbo, but it's like arcade genre. I don't know. That's where I'm going with it. Um, but before each one starts, they have this like very interesting kind of intro to each game that like gives it a little context. So like there's like a character you play as, like this blocky character. He doesn't look mm -hmm. like anything special. He looks like he's wearing like a like a astronaut spacesuit um, and it's like spraying the bees. But uh, each of these kind of stories like gives it like a little context for the game. It's, and it's it's not worded. You know, there's no like real story per se, but one of them seems like it's he's getting abducted by a UFO or, you know, and then, and then like another one, he's like facing like these overlords. Or so like there's these cool little um, intros to each game. Now I want to talk about, um, I'm not gonna talk about each game individually, but I will mention them by name. Uh, so they are Beat, Core, Void, Runner, Fate, and Flu Percentage Sign. I think that's supposed to say Flux, but I'm just looking at the screen here. Yeah, ah, yeah. Percentage Sign, confirmed. Um, so these are, I don't know like how best to describe it, because like, if I just say like the first one plays like Pong, I'm underselling it. But essentially, that's what it is. You get these little um, pellets that come across the screen, but it's like really intense Pong where they like, you know, like you have to keep up a combo and then you go through different phases that you either stay above the phase or below the phase. And once you get to that lower kind of nether realm, you pass away and like your, your score, um, you, you diminish. The last game, Flux, is like that as well. I don't think those games are my personal favorites because you use the stylus to control the uh, paddle. Um, or you can use the control stick, but it doesn't move fast enough. I think some of the other games are where it's really more impressive. Most notably Runner. I think this was based off of Bit Trip Runner. And that was kind of like a standalone awesome title. Um, and the, the way I would describe these games as almost as kind of like artistic rhythm games that have unique like kind of game physics. Runners just like that because you know as you run you either avoid obstacles or you pick up plus signs or um, like pieces of gold that are like bonus points and every time you get one you hear like a unique sound and it like goes along with like this kind of like it starts off at like a very non like audible kind of like sound or like just very low and then it becomes like a song or a soundtrack by the end of the stage. Alex do you think I'm doing a good job describing that? Yeah that's that's, that's a pretty good way of putting it like each each thing you pick up, each piece of gold or whatever, yeah, does add to the, the overall soundtrack and stuff. Kind of adds to the reward. It definitely is rewarding. It feels very satisfying by the t time that you complete a stage. Technically, I mean, Bit Trip Runner, you could say, is mappable in its own right. Because, like, there's, like, three sets of levels and each one is, like, pretty unique. I think it's it controls the best. It, it's 
arguably the best of this collection. The other ones feel like more simple games. Like I think uh, Void is like where you play as like a black dot that just like gets bigger as you collect and absorb other black dots. And then you just release when you see like other things that could destroy you coming across the screen. Um, there's another one, Core, that's kind of rhythm based and you have to like tap like up, down, left, right, depending on where the pellets go. And um, Fate, I think, is probably the second best game here where uh, you play as like the main guy and it's like a spaceship shooter uh, where you control the direction of the shots and also um, you can move him back and forth on kind of like these waveforms. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. limited, it's very restricted, but it's it's very interesting and it's it's a fun experience. There's levels to it. And uh, yeah, just, just very unique, interesting compilation, arguably one of the strongest arcade titles on the console. And uh, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. His name's Commander Video. You're welcome. I fucking love BitTrip. I did a uh, video back in 2016, I think, um, where I did, I went through the, the like, uh, overall, like, the plot of each title and kind of talked about, like, the themes of, like, what was happening. One of, one of the things that, like, I kind of, like, showed off and, like, what, I, what really stuck with me, there's this... Um, there's this scene in Bit Trip Fate, which is a literal on rail shooter. You're stuck on a rail, um, where he kind of uh, his ego becomes too big, and he's you know he has other friends in that game, including Meat Boy. He's there, um, and there's a scene where the other characters um, ditch him, and towards the end, and the way that they represent this is that each character, you know, is pretty simple whenever you look at their designs. So they they what they did was they took like. A little black line for for video. Then they had like Meat Boy was a square, uh, like a red square. And then they had like the other characters just just shapes, and they made somehow made a whole cutscene out of that. Like 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 just, just like just having these little shapes move around with like no distinguishing features. And it's still you know, and th they were still able to tell the story that they were wanting to tell just by doing that. And it was like it was crazy. Is this and, in uh, Saga or in the Wii version? It's in it's in Fate. Oh, so it There's is in part... Fate, which is in Saga. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a part in Fate, and I, well, and also I wanted to add, you can get this collection also on PS4 digitally. Um, and then the Runner games went on to you know have sequels with with Runner, Runner Two, Future Legend of Rhythm Alien, best title title ever, and uh, Runner Three. So that also series, a great did... title. yeah, <laughs> not as cool as Future Legend of Rhythm Alien. Um, but still cool, <laughs> Runner Three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Runner Three. But uh, I just wanted to add that uh, I, I absolutely love bit trip and those games are our art they're, they're fantastic it had like kind of a color zen feel to it i don't know if you guys played that like the one where you just drag the shapes but obviously more um you know realized yeah they're almost like atari games in a sense yeah. like you know like the, how simple they are definitely they like the simpler ones I, i'd say runner is definitely like leagues ahead and probably fate as well yeah but for sure i definitely got that atari vibe is this one that looks like a like a DNA helix? Is that fate? The one that looks yeah, the, 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 that like is he's like stuck on like a little rail type thing? It's hard to make out what's going on in this picture, but I'm assuming <laughs> the the one that you know has a DNA helix on it. Yeah, yeah, it's fate. Yeah, it's a fun one. It looks freaking cool. Like it integrates 3D with like like almost like Katamari Damacy style 3D blocks. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah. It's on the 3DS. Yeah. It's true. Though it's, uh, I would like to add that, that, that the Wii version also uses motion controls for a lot of them because they were originally WiiWare titles. Nope, I'm out. <laughs> and then uh, the PS4 one also surprisingly uses motion controls for, for some of them. Like the um, like um, Beat, you actually move the controller. Like you tilt it up and down to move your paddle and stuff. Okay, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> So. Teddy's Teddy just kind of goes with the wind on this one. <laughs> it's the swimming pool model. I'm at woman and I'm out. The next I'm in. <laughs> All right, Brian sent me an NES. So one game I knew I had to get for NES would be the original Dragon Warrior. So that's what I'm playing today. Oh, Dragon Warrior oh, I one. Nice. Yeah. What? <laughs> Did you know I'm a Dragon Quest fan? It's been about three to four years since I played the original back with Spencer. 
I played back then a Super Famicom version of it and a translation patch, which is probably the best way to play. But I had never played the NES version. I think I tried it, and it was very antiquated. But now that I have the antiquated hardware, I figured it's worth the shot. I really love this experience of just like taking an NES cart, wiggling it in the, Great, the isn't little it? NES toaster box. And just the idea of like playing the original Dragon Warrior cart is uh, it's fantastic. It actually just feels like the original RPG. Everything from the text, you know, to the mechanics. You know, there's some to love and some to hate, but I'll start with what I love. Um, it just feels like a classic RPG. This is, if I was to characterize Dragon Warrior 1, it is the original grinding RPG where every level matters, every piece of equipment you're able to obtain, and the gold you save up matters because it dictates how far you can progress along the world. For instance, I would not be able to take down one of these, I think they're called magicians. Uh, if I did not have a level four main hero, it is the one party member RPG, turn based RPG, which is not common. There may be other examples like that that I'm not aware of, but uh, this is, you know, it's the starting point for that. And it just feels so classic. You know, it's got the the simple loops, but they're so charming. You know, the the chip tune loops as they play. Da, 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 da. And, yeah. And it's really just impressive what they were able to come up with. 80. 6 87 I want to say we got it in 80 Yeah, we got it in 89. 89. Yeah, 88. 89, but the game so was done in Japan before that. I had a great time just kind of putting it on, grinding, battles go down in a sec. Oh, you know, finish the slime, good. We got one gold, two XP, move on. And you could walk two steps or you could walk 20 before you get into another encounter. It's a game of discovery where you discover new towns around you. And it's really cool. Uh, I really like the the like language and stuff and kind of like trying yeah, to figure same. out what am I supposed to do, who am I supposed to talk to, and some of the systems are pretty competent for one of the first turn-based RPGs. You know, even from seeing your like equipment on the menu, how it affects your stats, they're very simple. It's like attack, defense, and uh, there's some other run, one. Run, I, attack, I don't know. magic, I think. Yeah, well, you have the basic ones to HP, MP, etc. It's all there. Uh, where it gets complicated is the quality of life stuff isn't all there. For instance, even from the start, when you start in the king's room and you go to the stairs, you walk over the stairs, and it's like, huh, why am I standing over the stairs? You have to go to the menu to press a button that says stairs. Now, granted, it does it happen that much in the game where you're stepping over stairs? No, but it is a little nuisance. Or if I go up to somebody to talk, I'm used to in games just pressing A. Okay, talk. No, you go to the menu and then you press talk. Clearly, it's a very early example. But I really like what I played. I like the style. I like even just kind of like the old English language. Uh, Thou hath receiveth a wooden stick or a, a cypress stick. And yeah, I just, I, I really like it. It gets the job done. It's a good RPG. It is probably the classic, the one to own on the NES. Right now, of the three NES games I own, it's probably the most playable and the most enjoyable for me. So, I'm so, I'm so glad I'm you got that one. one. That's a nice surprise. I didn't know you got that one. That's awesome. I'm glad you're playing the first day NES one. Awesome. Soon to be of the four NES games. What? I'm oh. sitting to the NES game right now. It's in the mail. <laughs> Let's go. Ooh. Um, nice. I'm curious, now that you've played through basically all the Dragon Quests, do you look back at this differently? Or does it does, is it any different to you playing the original? From an NES perspective, yes. I think one thing that I'm struggling with is just the hardware because, you know, my CRT is at my parents' house. So I'm playing on a mini HD TV with an NES, which isn't great. There is no great alternative for HDMI or the NES. I know Brian mentioned hooking up to a VCR yeah. player. I don't uh, Yeah, have HD one. DVD or DVD recorder. You can pass it through there and hook HDMI out to your TV. So... 
the fuzzies, I, I don't know what it's outputting in 144 or 240, but it like tires my eyes looking at the screen for more than 30 minutes. Mm. Yeah. So just from like a hardware perspective, it, it's you actually have to have the right stuff to mm -hmm. play it. Like granted, I could I could also get a Retron, you know, or uh, one of these other NES clones. Um, I know that adapters tend to cause lag, but it's not a big deal for Dragon Warrior because it's turn based. So in that respect, I'm I'm struggling a little bit. But I'm still enjoying it and willing to kind of put up with it. From a gameplay perspective, I think it's just refreshing to see how intact it still is. And also, you know, the other ones, I, they're not like story heavy per se, but there is more story. Whereas this one is just the meat and potatoes. This is the action experience. It's the get out of town and grind, go save. Like, I guess there's the go save the princess arc. Story is really a backseat to the, in this one. But I think it is the the one where the grinding is the most felt. So in that respect, it, it, like from a, a gameplay perspective, I kind of really like that. And it's very simple. You know, it's it's just like meat and potatoes. You know, it's nothing fancy, but it's really good when you eat it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I feel about Dragon Warrior 1. Mm. The meat and potatoes of of turn-based RPGs. Yeah, it's very it's very good. I mean... It, one thing you can get into, I don't know if you figured out, it, when you have one character you, and you're underleveled, sometimes you get into this situation where you hit some guy and he attacks you and hits you, but you have to heal. So you heal, okay, I, I'm up, so I attack again, and then he heals, and you kind of get into this like uh, situation where you're not making any progress because you're constantly healing every turn. You don't have somebody to help you, you know, another party member to pick you up. Um, but that's just that's just a small thing for leveling. Um, that you go through. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is a, I don't know if you know this, but on the NES version, there's this little section when you go from Tantagel. Uh, if you go southwest, there's mountains that you can't pass. It's like these uh, mountains that you can't walk on, and then there's these cragged mountains you can't. If you walk back and forth there, uh, you'll fight magicians, uh, drakeys, and other higher level enemies. Some, and you can level up a lot quicker if you go there. It was an overlap mm -hmm. in the zones that you could actually fight there without going around the map so that's what i usually oh, do when I I, so if you want to start it again make it go a little faster you can just fight down and that just walk back and forth there and you can gain up to level five six pretty quickly until you get heal and then you can go a little further and it's all about like equipment check the game basically because you got one party member it's very you feel the levels like you said like when you get a level you, it's significant like you feel it you get you can hit harder you get a new spell which makes a big difference you can use hurt to hurt the scorpions now because your attack was too strong, not weak enough. Um, and it's basically just equipment check the game. It's very simple, like you said. You, there's only a few things you can buy. And like, granted, I don't know if you ran into this problem. Like, you don't know what's stronger in a shop because they don't list it on your uh, your status bar. But you can just look that up online now. Or you know, I don't. Did you get the um, a cart only, or did you get like a complete? Uh, I got the card only, but there's a, like a box repro thing on Etsy mm -hmm. that I'm going to check out where you could also get manuals reprinted. Mm -hmm. I know like this game came with a map. Uh, I don't know if I need it. I, I printed out a guide a long time ago, so maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll get the N Nintendo Power one or check one of your scans that talks about it. Um, I do want to come back to that question, though, because I think that as far as the Dragon Quest series as a whole, this is not the chef's kiss. You know, this is not the one that pulls at the the heartstrings when you come into like a town of frozen people or something. You know, like uh, there's so many instances of that in future Dragon Quest games uh, after the NES, and this this ain't it. <laughs> this is this is go fight monsters in the field and uh, beat the game, which is refreshing mm -hmm. because so much of the series isn't like that. Mm -hmm. But it's still shared. You can see the bones of what's to come in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. Maybe we do spoilers here or something. But do you? Maybe we can avoid them. It's up to you. Do we? Do Do you feel like they had one, two, and three planned at this point, or at least some kind of idea for it? Mm. And the the reason obviously they mentioned yeah, Eredric, exactly. right? You know, um, in this game. I think they probably just planned around it after the fact. 
I, yeah, I think uh, you know two is a sequel, but then why would three be a prequel? Like uh, logically, like usually you make a trilogy like starting from the you know beginning point. Mm-hmm. So it could have been like a rough idea. Who knows? Yeah, they rushed. They one was a success, and they wanted uh, Chunsoft wanted another one. Uh, so they had a year turnaround to make two. Um, and I think if it was planned, they did a heck of a job in such a short amount of time. So I don't know. I don't know if they, he had it in mind, stuff he couldn't do. I think probably Hori might have said somewhere, I don't know, but there was stuff in one that, that he wanted to do, like mm. multiple party members and stuff, maybe. I'm not sure. I, I kind of remember saying that, but he couldn't do in the time. You know, because this was their first game he was making for Spike Chunsoft or Spike yeah. Chunsoft. So he couldn't, he was just making it to put it out there. And I think they did take like multiple party members and stuff in two. And maybe from, you know, cause I don't know how you design a game, but there was probably talks about how should we connect the world. So I'm, I'm going to say like par- more, more, uh, if it was me, if I was thinking, I'd probably say like his ideas for what he wanted to do, like gameplay wise, were more planned out than the story. The story probably just came mm-hmm. together as the game was coming together. Mm-hmm. So, I, I would, that. I would. Bad. And then by three, right. I, I think three, he would probably had something more in mind because he had a little, he had more like the developer, like really gave him like the time probably to, I don't know how far three I, was I, from two. I just think it's so interesting that in the first one, they had that weird, it just seems like not normal. Like that, that addition of the Erdrich stuff. It's like, that's just interesting to me that they had that in there. Well, they had to have a story. They had to have characters. So they had to probably just threw it together at the time. So maybe he had something planned out and that's the simplest he could do with what he could do. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I they are I, a year apart, yeah. you know? So, so I mean, it's, it's possible it was all written and they couldn't fit yeah. it and, you know, one NES cart. I don't know. You know, two is a little more close to home because it's like, you even start and I mean, spoilers, I guess, you know, you, you see the Dragon Lord's castle and like there's a nice guy in it. You know, so it's like, the, you know, they play with that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you go into his castle and you see his grandson there. I think it's his grandson. And he talks to you like you can get up the Erdrich sword in there. And he tells you to beat Mauroth and then you go out. Yeah, they're, like they had to have something planned because like or, I would think so. Because like all of Dragon Quest one, uh, uh, Alephgard is in Torland is the overall map of Dragon Quest one and two. The world is called Torland. And Alephgard is that little part of Dragon Quest Two, right in the center, mm-hmm. and travel to. So I would think they probably had something planned out, or they couldn't do maybe on the first one. I don't know. Alex, you had something you want to ask or comment? Yeah, R- rate the box art, rate rate the cover art of Dragon Warrior. Me? Yes, right now. I would have to receive it. Do you have it? I mean, you have the cartridge. It's the same thing. So of the, the cartridge picture. or the box art? It's the same picture. It's in my... Uh, yeah, that. It's in my uh, NES. I didn't want to wiggle it out. There you go. Oh. He's, Brian's got it. I love that. Yeah, I can't... I, as much as I don't care about Dragon Quest, I love the Dragon Warrior box arts. I think they're so cool. Yes. Yeah. This one is awesome. So there's a first print and a second print. The first print has a misspelling. If you look on the back, it says... The slime's hit points decrease by yeah, it's blurry. It by hits decrease by one. Where in the re-release it says like the slime's HP reduces by one. So this is the first. This is the Nintendo Power. It came with like some extra stuff. This is the Nintendo Power subscription version. Uh, it came with like. So the original version didn't come with this. This is basically a strategy guide that went through the whole game. So it basically spoiled the whole game for you. <laughs> Um, so cool to have. It, Haven't you shown this before? I might have. I don't know. <laughs> it, because people were stupid here. They didn't know how to play these games, me included. And I'm saying I'm stupid because without this, I probably would have had a hard time with this game. Because uh, before that, I got it in 89, I want to say, um, and for free. Um, and I'd never played anything like this. But once I learned how to play it, it was very addicting. And that's part of the reason I like Dragon Quest so much, is just experience going through the first one, pouring over this manual, and figuring out what an RPG was. Because I never played anything quite like this. But if you can find this, Teddy, I think this isn't too expensive on 
maybe it goes for a few bucks. Um, cause these, these were produced like candy and they produced so many of them that they gave them away to for subscribers to Nintendo power. So, uh, you can probably get this manual somewhere in good condition. The box and the manual and the strategy guide, or I think, I don't know if that is the manual. I think it's like goes around 60 bucks. That's with cart and the cart's cheap. Like I get wow, the, the cart for like 10 bucks, I didn't know you know? Exactly. So I don't know. I, if, if needed, I don't need it to play it, but it would be a cool collector's item. I do want to eventually get each of the Dragon Warrior games that exist on NES. Um, they all have cool take boss my time. There's yeah. no rush. Yeah. I am playing through the longest one right now, you know, so I got time. Akira well, I think Toriyama after art you... or bus for me. Well, I do like, like Teddy said, the localization. That's just Dragon here. Ball. <laughs> I do like the localization to old English in the American version. There's something about Valen that I thought that was cool as a kid. Mm. And it wasn't until much later I knew even what Puff Puff was because they didn't really have that in the first Dragon Quest. That I, if they did, that's I all thought, three. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, they took that out, I think. And then three had like I think they were a, 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 um, the NES version of three. She sells you tomatoes. They didn't say Puff Puff. So oh. Some, like, I, think you, I think you go to the, the desert town of Arakaba or Arakaba, something like that's what it's called. And then she says, my dad sells you tomatoes or something and instead of a pop-up. Because pop. I guess tomatoes... They fix that in the remake. Yeah. But there's something that there's charming. I like the old English localizations of the NES ones. Yeah. It's more playable than I thought. I, th I was surprised. I thought it would be, like, too, like, difficult to get into. But it's really not. It's, it's actually... Yeah. It's actually pretty good because you got to think they made this to be an introduction of uh, the pc games for japanese players so they couldn't make it overly difficult for them they had to make it because they haven't played anything like this so they had to put it out and make it very player friendly as they could so they could get into it get them hooked on it you know so they can make more it all comes back to the business it's all about business it's all about the money it's all about the he about. says she said uh... mm -hmm. that's cool Glad you got you're playing Dragon Quest on the NES. Yeah. Dragon Warrior. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, my mistake. Dragon Warrior. Next up is two. Gotta get two. I thought you were gonna say next up is Alex. Oh. <laughs> no, you guys just I keep going Alex, on. I think like Alex, Alex fell asleep, I think. All right, I'll tell I'll tell you to you about Dragon Warrior Two. Yeah, like I'm gonna take a nap. Famicom. No, I'm joking. Alex, uh, Brian has summoned you. Back to the forefront. And we're going to go head first into the final game for Game Talk. Uh, initially, I had a lot of games in mind. And games in general are just sentimental to me. Although I, I like to downsize my collection. It's usually with the intent of preserving the ones that I really care about. And I think back to a game that you're probably not expecting from me. But it's aligned with a lot of the things I've been talking about. In the, even in the Q&A sections. Back in, I'd say maybe 2016, I ordered an import model of a, a Sega Dreamcast. And, you know, I'm not, like, I've, I've never been a huge Sega console owner. Not until I came back from school and I started collecting did I own a Sega Genesis, did Alex get me a Sega Saturn. And so when I looked into the Dreamcast, not only was the unit expensive, but the games were expensive, etc. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go the import route. I'm also going to teach myself some Japanese. So I bought myself an import uh, Sega Dreamcast from Japan. Thing came over, first came over, started honking at me. Like, every time you turn the console on. And so... It's like, this isn't good. I can't play this. Like, I feel bad. I feel like I'm scratching my discs. So I sent it back to the guy. Actually, I didn't even send it back. I just said, hey, you know, here's my Dreamcast. I took a video of it and I sent it to him in an email. And he's like, oh, that's terrible. And so he sent me another Sega Dreamcast. I had two Sega Dreamcast import models. And I built up a decent collection. I have maybe like 10, 15 games, all cheap. If you like pro collector tip, if you're trying to go for old consoles, is get those import games, whether it's N64, Sega Dreamcast, Sega Saturn, doesn't matter. Like they're they are dirt cheap by comparison. So here I was with all these import games in Japanese. And I just lost the stamina to keep teaching myself Japanese. So I ended up like not playing Grandia 2. I ended up not playing uh, Shenmue. I ended up uh, not playing a lot of the games except for like the arcade style games. I was really disappointed I got a Sega Dreamcast until I found out about a game that was 
released after the Sega Dreamcast had ceased. So one thing about the Dreamcast is that it received homebrew games around like 10, 15 years later. And this one was a standout for the console, so much so that one of my favorite YouTube content creators did a video on it that really won me over. And that was uh, Mark Bustler from Classic Game Room. He did a video on Sturmwind for the Sega Dreamcast, a game that came out in 2013. And they made another print run of it in like 2017. So I ordered it through PlayAsia. I got the game in the sleek Sega Dreamcast case. I didn't pay more than like maybe 60 bucks for it. Or maybe even 40. I don't, I don't remember at this point. But the game was so good. You know, I played Spaceship Shooters. And this one is it's similar and different in many ways. But I think the thing that I really appreciate about Stormwind is that every level feels like a theatrical event. It's like something, you know, like almost a piece of art. So like most games, when you think back to like what they sound like, you can think of the OST. Earthbound has a lot of classic OST that I know of because before I even knew the game. But the interesting thing about the levels in Stormwind is you could start it off and all you're hearing is the sounds of German pilots on a submarine and this kind of like aquatic effects. You don't even hear music and then it starts to crescendo like halfway through each level. I do find that there's, there's approximately 20 levels and each one of them is very difficult and there's an interesting system for saving your ship. That's actually like a big reason why spaceship shooters tend to be difficult is because if you don't have like a shield on your ship, then it's really easy to just like bump into things like, you know, with collision with like either objects on screen or like the uh, parameters, the, the walls. With Sturmwind, you have three weapons. You have like a, a red weapon that kind of like, as you let go of the button, this, the shot begins to spread almost like you're spreading like octopus legs or something. You have another one that's like a blue curve shot and you have another one that's just a straight green shot. Each have different power levels and different um, ranges, I guess, but you can also change the fire mode so it goes behind you. And you collect these little upgrades too uh, to power them up. It's actually like these little color upgrades, but you shoot them and you have to align them with either one of the ones that you lost or with the same color upgrade. I don't want to lose you guys on like the description of how this works, but I'm almost done, I promise. Um, it's really interesting because it makes you think about A, what you need to, like, to get through this level, but B, um, like whether you want to lose which upgrade and when. And when you lose an upgrade, you're losing part of your shield. You can get it back later if you find some of these upgrades throughout the level, but at what cost? And so you usually only have like two lives going into each mission. But I really loved just the difficulty, like the uh, theme for each level. It was very aquatic. I remember fighting like a big football fish at one point. Another time there's like a puffer fish that starts from the start of the stage. The classic is like that big, evil, sinister looking octopus, which the game came out with this cute little plushie for it. And just a lot of amazing awesome experiences and now they have it on steam and the nintendo switch so i'm currently playing it on the nintendo switch it's called Stormwind ex a lot of great levels it's beautiful it sounds great there's a lot of like funny little throwbacks in there uh interesting thing maybe for alex here i think it was originally programmed for like the jaguar or something but they like ceased production on it and so some of the things are throwbacks into the in the game one of the things i remember is like i'm going through this level it's very serious and then all of a sudden i see a soccer ball running across the stage the funniest thing um but i i love this game i can't recommend it enough it has button mapping so like <laughs> it's, it's a winner in my book as a as a pro button mapper here <laughs> i've always been very interested in this game and i've always been very interested in like homebrew communities i'm a big part oh well, not a big part because i don't make games but i'm a big connoisseur of the atari 2600 homebrew community so i'd be interested in, in maybe getting the dreamcast release of this maybe it's very reasonably priced, too, on the Switch. You get it for like 12 bucks, as well as on Steam. Versus when uh, I saw the game on eBay, I think it was like $80, $90. Mm. And unfortunately, when I got it on the Dreamcast, I did the one playthrough. I went back to play it like a year later, and the game just, like, it would play up until like the title screen and then just stop. And it was so weird because it was a new, it was a new disc from PlayAsia, so I don't really know what happened there. When did they re release that game? Like, how late uh what was the year they released that game 
2013 or 2014. Uh, Mark gave it game of the year for 2013, but then I'm looking on another Sega fan site and they're saying 2014. So sometime around then, depending on your region. Yeah, I do recall like a lot of YouTubers did uh, videos about that game and I remember watching footage, but I've, I've never played it. It's so approachable, even like for a spaceship shooter fan, because you could take it mission by mission. There's no like credit system. So, and you also have difficulty selection, easy, normal, hard. I'm playing on normal right now. I think originally I played it on easy. I'm almost done with the game. Uh, but you could do arcade mode as well if you wanted to take everything on, you know, in sync. I just think that it's a little intimidating, even for someone who's like played the game a second time. Does the EX version have has any like extra content or features or? I think there's like a couple extra bosses. I'll pull it up real quick. I'm not really sure. I haven't noticed much of a difference. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything on the actual um, page, but it's probably there. Okay. Why is this game perfect for Spencer? Um, Spencer does not play shoot 'em ups or or spaceship shooting games. He played them at the dentist years ago, and I think I just have a correlation between the two. Dentist. <laughs> Something about caveats. Every time, every time I see uh, Gradius, I just think of the dentist. Yeah. Yeah. I just hear. <laughs> We're gonna fix your teeth. <laughs> Did you want to learn German, Spencer? Um, no. Warst du Deutsch uh, erlernt? I don't know. It's been a while since I spoke German. <laughs> but it's pretty sincere. I thought it's cool. Like it's, you know, it's an international game by like a small company. You know. Mm -hmm. That's uh. It feels like you know. I feel like we get a lot of Japanese games, a lot of Japanese style games. So it's always cool to see like a game that feels more European. Sure. Um, I'm looking here. I know originally you used to be able to input your high scores onto a website with like a code you get after you beat the game on the Dreamcast. I think they have like online leaderboards. Um, I'm seeing like also additional super weapons. And I think maybe the addition of button mapping makes it kind of interesting here. Okay. Stormwind or Darius Guide? Oh, Stormwind is... is Far more approachable, I feel. Or Ikaruga. I was going to say Ikaruga. Nah, Ikaruga is not... I don't think that's approachable. That game is hard as hell. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking for, like, shooter fans. Even me. Like, I think that the stuff in Stormwind is far more intuitive. While I I think Ikaruga is cool, I, I found it... I found it just, like, difficult for the sake of difficulty. I don't know. Versus this is this not a bullet hell like this is this is a well paced game where you'll be paying attention the whole time and not feel cheated. Okay. And I think just the combat system in general is very intuitive and it keeps you thinking about where's the next upgrade? Am I too far on the side of the screen? You know, should I fire forward or behind? You know, what upgrade do I want to get now? It's so cool because like even the octopus shot, like you get like you can. As you get upgrades, you can fire directly forward, so it increases your your radius that you can fire. But you only get up to like three x of the whatever power up you're on. You can also store them, but it's like you know, um, in Musha, it's they're called like little buddies, I guess. These little guys on the side of your ship that like stay with you, and you don't want them to get hit. It's a similar system where your upgrades are like these little side ships that are helping you as you um, play the game. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now on uh, the steam store page and it looks really cool man the the art i'm going to add it to my wish list on steam <laughs> mission accomplished i want to see more like it so please buy it mm -hmm. oh, it looks me. looks really good man it Love is it. well accepted by our community too i know boston burf has recommended it. i know leo has recommended it so i i know it's you know even for like you know within our circle it's it's known mm -hmm. I love some shooters. Switch, man. Switch is quite a shooter house. It is. It sure is, man. It's, it's nuts. If you, if a you lot want of weird stuff shooters, on there, too. If you want spaceship shooters, if you want twin stick shooters, 
If you want some, gr- some graphic novel games where you can date a high school Japanese anime girl. Oh, sign me up. <laughs> sign up for an import or a Japanese account today. 